Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. As always, happy whatever day it is. Welcome to episode 154 of Left Side of the Aisle. I'm your host, and my name's Larry Erickson, and for the next half hour, I'm going to be your ranter and raconteur, going on and on and on about things that are important to me and I think are worthy of your attention. If you have any reactions to the show, any comments, questions, whatever, uh, email them to me directly. The email address is whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G, at AOL.com. Uh, or you can go to my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, and you can leave a comment there, or you can get the email address from there if you didn't get it. Uh, one thing I ask, or two things I ask actually about email, one is that uh, be sure to include something in the subject line, like, you know, left side of the aisle or something, so I clearly know it's not spam, and uh, two, be a little patient about getting an answer. I can be a little slow about answering email, but uh, I do answer. Uh, so, anyway, getting to this week's show, uh, we're going to dr- uh, dive right in with one of our regular weekly features. It's the Outrage of the Week. Now, this story is actually about two weeks old, but I, I consider it a follow up of sorts to my discussion last week about global warming and the responses to the latest report from the IPCC. The story starts, though, back in 2012 uh, with a paper by a a man named Stephen Lewandowski. He's of the School of Psychology at the University of Western Australia. He wrote a paper with some others, which showed a correlation between being a nanny-nanny naysayer on climate change and being a believer in a variety of other conspiracy theories. That is, there is a connection between believing in, um, in believing in conspiracies and refusing to accept the reality of the science of climate change. As the title of the paper says, NASA faked the moon landing, therefore climate science is a hoax, an anatomy of the motivated rejection of science. That's the title of the paper. The paper was published in the journal Psychological Science. Uh, it produced a tsunami of nasty comments from the nanny nanny naysayers who didn't like it being pointed out how similar they are to conspiracy nuts. Um, and they didn't like this even though their arguments against the reality of climate change are usually based around some sort of conspiracy among scientists who apparently are all radical left-wing activists seeking to destroy our way of life. Now, in fact, the theory in response to this paper, the, the theory that uh, was found online, uh, became the idea that the people taking the theory, uh, the survey rather, that, were, uh, that was part of the paper, uh, were overwhelmingly people who actually accept the science, but who instead of answering the survey honestly, somehow all decided to impersonate uh, climate kooks and giving the craziest possible answers to the questions they could in order to make the contrarians look like the wackos that they are. So in other words, in a paper about a tendency among this group of people to believe in conspiracy theories, it was met with a conspiracy theory. In fact, the reactions were so many and so intense that they provided the basis for another paper by Lewandowski, this one titled, Recursive Fury, Conspiracist Ideation in the Blogosphere and Responding to Research on Conspiracist Ideation. The paper was published in the journal Frontiers of Psychology in 2013. All right, here's where the outrage comes in. Frontiers in Psychology has now formally retracted the paper after what the journal called a small number of complaints um, from the naysayers who claimed that the, that the article was defamatory, the paper was defamatory. The study was removed from the journal's website last year while the editors of the journal considered you know, the complaints that were made against it. And now they have retracted it while posting a notice that said, in effect, that they couldn't find anything scientific or academic or ethical wrong with the paper, but they just did not want to risk getting sued. Now, thanks to the University of Western Australia, I should mention the paper can still be found online, at least for now. If you want to be able to read this paper, go to my website. There'll be a link to it there. But the idea that a small number of complaints from these nanny nanny naysayers, because these people dislike how they are described in a scientific paper, the fact that that can force that paper to be retracted from a peer-reviewed journal, 
The, f the fact that they can use threats of suits and this kind of intimidation in order to hide the fact that they are conspiracy nuts who believe in some wide-ranging conspiracy among scientists and governments and scientific institutions around the world to deceive the public and create a hoax. The idea that they can do this, the idea that this kind of thing can actually undermine scientific evidence about the nature of the opposition to climate change, that is an outrage. It is, in fact, the outrage of the week. All right, moving on from there to another issue, a basic question. We talk about government spying and whatnot. I mean, how, how do they get away with this? I mean, how, how do they manage to, to do this? Well, this is how they do it. All right, first, a reminder and a definition. Phone metadata is all the information about a phone call except the actual content. It's a record of who called who, from where to where, from what number to what number, uh, when and for how long. Again, it's everything except the content. All right. In January, months and months after Edward Snowden first revealed documents showing that the U.S. was collecting, amassing metadata about tens of millions of the phone calls of Americans, uh, Barack Obama, the amazing Mr. O, announced that uh, the government would now limit collection of online uh, phone metadata. Rather, On March 27th, the plan to do that appeared. Uh, a, a plan that claimed the program is being brought to an end. Now remember, this program, for all that time, we were told that this program was vital to national security. We had to do this. It was necessary. It was absolutely just, we had to do this, or we we're opening the country to risk of a whole string of 9-11s, and won't you be sorry then, we've actually got to do this. Um, and in fact, the only reason you know about it is because Edward Snowden is either a traitor or a Russian spy. And now it turns out, actually we didn't have to do it after all. But instead, here's the new plan. The records will not be held by the government. They'll be held by the phone companies. And the government can only examine these records with the approval of a court. The program would also be modified so the government can only survey within two, or a, a query rather, within two hops of a selection term, that is the original phone number they were looking at, rather than three hops as now. Okay, that's basically the program. There are already a number of red flags that should be flying here. First, the records are still there. They're still being collected. The only difference is that the phone company holds them instead of the federal government, and the government can still demand to see and examine them. I'm not sure why that's supposed to make us feel better. Second, the difference between a warrantless search, as it's being done now, and a search via a court-issued warrant is, in this case, really nothing more than semantics. Remember, these warrants would be issued by the very secretive Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, uh, or the FISC, which was created by the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, FISA, in 1978. Uh, in fact, FISA, by the way, was passed in response to evidence of earlier violations of privacy uh, and political intrusion into our lives by earlier administrations. All right, here's the deal. In the period from 1979, when this court got started, to the end of 2012, that court, the, 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 the FISC, was presented with, with the feds, uh, uh, by, um, by the feds rather, with 33,949 applications for warrants, just under 34,000 applications for warrants. Of those 34,000, only 504, which is 1.5%, were even modified. Only 11 of them, which is 0.03%, three one-hundredths of 1% 1 of them, were rejected. And in fact, of those 11, four were later modified and then approved. The idea that this court, that the FISC, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, acts as a guarantee of our rights and a protector of our privacy is ludicrous. All right, another thing here is the hops. 
These are the, if you will, the degrees of separation uh, from the original number. Now, uh, NASA, as it stands, NASA can query the metadata of an individual. Let's pretend it's your phone number, okay? Um, if the, assuming the court approves, they can examine the metadata of all of your phone numbers, and uh, of your phone number, and then they can examine the metadata of anyone you talk to on the phone, whether they called you or you called them, doesn't matter. It was a phone contact. Um, they can then query the metadata of all of those people, and then the metadata, that's one hop, and then the metadata of all of the people, all of those people contacted by phone. That's two hops. Um, a 19, uh, tw you, you may have heard about the famous six degrees of separation, the idea that anybody can be connected to anybody else in no more than six steps. Uh, a 2011 study actually found when you include online stuff that the average number of degrees of separation between you and anybody else in the world is less than five. It would frequently, most times, take nothing between more, more than four or five hops to get you to any other person in the world. The point here is limiting the search to two hops is basically meaningless because already after two hops, you are already starting to drown in data. You are already reaching the limits of usable information. Going to that third hop just doesn't really accomplish anything. So going from three hops to two hops is meaningless. Put bluntly, these so-called changes to the program mean essentially nothing. And despite the claim that the program is ending, it's actually being continued just in a slightly different form. In fact, now this is a long, I gotta tell you, this is a long-standing practice among the spooks in Washington. J. Edgar Hoover used to do this all the time. When he'd be found having the FBI doing something that it really wasn't supposed to be doing, he'd be ordered to stop the program and destroy all those relevant files. He'd rename the program, refile the files, and then tell all and sundry that that program no longer existed. So at least give the White House credit for this. They learned from the best. All right, but that's not all. Because, like I said, this is how they do it. An examination last week of the White House proposal done by Mark Hosenball of Reuters found that this more limited program may well require the phone companies to collect and save more metadata than they do now. They may have to collect more information than they do for the specific purpose of having that information available to government spies. In fact, telecoms now may be collecting only somewhere between 25 and 33 percent of the metadata that they could collect. A real reason for this is the popularity of flat rate programs. And then the companies often don't collect the metadata because they don't need to keep track of your phone call, so they don't need that information. So they just don't collect it. But under the White House's plan, telecoms, quoting the plan, would be compelled by court order to provide technical assistance to ensure that the records can be queried and the results are transmitted to the government in a usable format and in a timely manner. In other words, the spooks would have to be able to get the metadata that they want, which means the phone companies have to have it in order for them to get it. In other words, this reform of the government spying on us not only does not in any way limit the government's ability to spy on us, it could enable them to spy on even more of us more effectively while at the same time claiming that the program has been put to an end. That is how they do it. We're taking a break. And here we are back. Not that we actually went anywhere. Um, all right, we're going to start the rest of the show going to our other regular weekly feature. It's the Clown Award, given as always for meritorious stupidity. The winner of the big red nose this week is U.S. District Court Judge Rosemary Collier. Now, a suit had been filed in federal court against the Obama administration over uh, drone killings in 2011 that killed three American citizens in Yemen. The White House, not surprisingly, argued to the court that this is a political matter, a policy question, and so was best left to Congress and the executive branch. 
Well, Judge Collier said that the case in, uh, involves, it raises significant constitutional issues and is not easy to answer. But despite that, she says she'll grant the motion to dismiss the suit. In other words, again, get, get this straight. This is Collier's attitude. This case raises serious constitutional questions which are not easy to answer and frankly, of course, dealing with, while, while you can say that it's for, uh, uh, as a general rule, it's for Congress and the White House to deal with political questions, dealing with constitutional questions is a basic function of the federal judiciary. But, hey, her attitude is, ah, the heck with it. Important constitutional issues, ah, I don't care. District Court Judge Rosemary Collier, who, by the way, is one of the judges on the uh, Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, and isn't it great to know we have such stalwart defenders of our Constitution on that court? District Court Judge Rosemary Collier, you are a clown. All right. A couple of weeks ago, Paul Ranton, who passes, for some reason, passes for an intellectual on the right wing in this country, uh, got my uncoveted clown award, and not for the first time. Well, he's back, because he recently went through his annual charade of presenting an ideological list, a wish list of attacks on the poor and public employees, uh, and, and uh, along with cuts for the, tax cuts for the rich and increases for the War Department, under the guise of claiming it's a federal budget proposal. Now, this so-called budget has been repeatedly and roundly and justifiably denounced and trashed as economic nonsense. Even Bloomberg.com, which is hardly some bastion of left-wing activism, called it a fantasy. But it's also been recognized, this actually isn't a budget, it's a political document to rouse the rabid faithful uh, for, the, for the battles to come rather than an actual budget. All right, but here's the thing. Here's the thing. It has been discussed. It has been debated, denounced, in some quarters defended, but it has been discussed. Widely and even intensely discussed. Okay. A couple of weeks earlier, March 12th, so there's no news cycle conflict here. A couple of weeks earlier, on March 12th, the Congressional Progressive Caucus released its own federal budget proposal. They call it the Better Off Budget. And they've been doing this for each of the last four years, presenting a budget proposal. And, and first things first, to realize that this is an actual budget proposal with actual numbers and actual economic analysis. It is not a wish list of don't worry, the market PBUI will solve all our problems of the sort that spews out all over Ryan's budget. It shows that this, the better off budget from the, from the Progressive Caucus shows that we can create jobs, improve infrastructure, uh, protect and aid the poor, protect the environment, improve education, improve housing, expand health care, and a whole lot of other things without having to raise taxes on anybody making less than a million dollars a year and cut the federal deficit significantly over the next 10 years all at the same time. And that sounds like a headline, doesn't it? So what kind of press coverage did this budget get? About that much. There was some coverage in expected places like The Nation, The New Republic, Truthout.org, In These Times. There was some analysis from groups like Citizens for Tax Justice, the National Priorities Project, the Economic Policy Institute. Um, but I have to say that after a fairly intensive search uh, the closest I could come to any what could be cover, considered mainstream coverage were opinion pieces in the Los Angeles Times, U.S. News and World Reports, two in the Huffington Post, and one in the Guardian, which is a newspaper in the United Kingdom. And in terms of actual coverage, one couple of minute item on MSNBC the day before the budget was released, and a report on Al Jazeera, which actually does cover a wide range of news, but which most Americans can't even see unless they know how to search it out on the internet. So basically, two, two reports and five opinion pieces. Other than that, pretty much complete 
total silence. The New York Times did not mention this budget, not a word. The Washington Post did not mention this budget, not a word. The Wall Street Journal did not mention this budget, not a word. The Network News never mentioned it. CNN never mentioned it. In fact, all of cable news, except for that one item on MSNBC, as far as I can determine, determine never mentioned it. So while I'm sure that you're aware that uh, Paul Ranton released his budget, I wouldn't be the least bit surprised to hear that until this moment, you didn't even know this other budget proposal even existed. The fact is, the media, the oh-so-liberal media, supposedly, has trapped itself into a way of thinking that what comes from the right, by definition, is, is worthy of serious consideration. Even if that's to knock it down, it's still worthy of serious consideration, while what comes out of the left can just be safely ignored. The result is that the right wing repeatedly gets to set the terms of debate, that Barack Obama is taken as the extreme left edge of permissible debate, and that's only because he's president, so they can't ignore him. And the answer to every policy question is for the left to move to the center, which of course is to the right of where they are, and of course then when you move to that center, well the center is still between you and the right, which means you have to go even further to the right in order to go to the center. And the reason we get, they get away with this is because we let them, we, I mean we, us, the American left, the actual left, we let them get away with it. And I, I don't only mean we only let the media get away with it, not just the media, although, you know, the truth is part of the reason the media behaves the way it does is that the right wing learned a long time ago how to work the refs. And the media starts to go along with right wing framing because they just don't want to have to deal with the hassle they get if they do anything else. Uh, but I don't only mean the media. I mean our, and I use the word cautiously here, our political leaders, or should I say leader. No matter how many promises Barack Obama has broken, no matter how many times he's disappointed or even angered his supporters, no matter how, many, how much he increases spying, no matter how many drone strikes he authorizes, no matter how many new military actions he authorizes in Africa, no matter how many undocumented workers he deports more than any other president, no matter how many whistleblowers he prosecutes more than all other presidents combined, no matter how many corporate crooks he coddles, no matter how much of a corporate agenda he pushes, no matter how many times he says he wants to cut Social Security and Medicare as part of some mythical grand bargain, no matter how many fill in your own blank, no matter what he does or doesn't do, there are still people going around with bumper stickers and buttons saying in one form or another, don't worry Mr. Prez, I got your back. Well, I, for all of you out there who have forgotten, we're not supposed to have his back. He's supposed to have ours. And in most ways, he just doesn't. The thing is, it's, this is not a matter of agreeing or disagreeing with a particular policy. It doesn't have to do with your stand on a particular issue or whether some arguing or whether some program goes a little too far or not quite far enough. It's a matter of the fact that there is a basic a fundamental divide in this country, one notably expressed in digest form by the Occupy movement about the 1% versus the 99%. It's not a matter of isolated issues. It's a matter of being aware of that divide and knowing which side you are standing on and being prepared to stand there with all of that entails. You want some examples of that divide? I'll give you two. For example, number one, consider General Motors, okay? Now, you probably know about this recent recall of 2.6 million older GM cars because of a faulty ignition switch that could jump from on, from, from run, to accessory or off while the car was moving, turning off the engine and causing you to lose power steering, power brakes, and the airbags. GM itself says it knows of 13 deaths and 32 crashes that resulted from this faulty switch. The flaw is the result of a wrongly designed part. A, it's a spring-type plunger that was too short to do what it was supposed to do so it could slip. The cost of the replacement part was 57 cents. Now, some have lift, leapt to their rhetorical feet to defend the company, say, well, that's not fair because uh, it's not just the cost of the replacement part. Um, you'd have to, uh, you'd have to, uh, uh, what about the cost of retooling the line in order to use this part instead of that part? All right. We'll include that. Suppose it cost a million dollars to retool. No, 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 no. Suppose it cost $10 million to retool that line. 
Ten million dollars spread over 2.6 million cars is three dollars and 85 cents per car. Add the new part and we come up to four dollars and 42 cents more per car. Do you really think that that would have been a deal breaker for you to in buying a then new car? But here's where it gets worse. This is where it gets bad. GM knew about a problem with this ignition switch no later than February of 2002. By 2000, the, the, the supplier of the switch told them, of the spring plunger thing, told them it doesn't meet your specifications. By 2003, GM's own engineers were reporting problems. Oh, the company investigated, but in 2005, they said, forget it because, quote, none of the solutions represents an acceptable business case. Even after learning of the deaths from the failing switch, GM continued to stall to investigate for years and to do essentially nothing until the recall began, nearly 12 years after GM knew of this problem. 12 years they let this go on without acting. Uh, now they are finally doing something about the threat of death that they thrust onto unknowing customers because for 12 years the business case was to do little and say less. But there's still people defending GM about how it's taking responsibility and it's not fair to expect the company to spend the money to repair the switches that are being recalled which never should have been there in the first place. Those people and GM are on the other side of that divide from us. GM is not on your side and you should not be on theirs. Alright, you want another example? UPS. Gina Reyes is a was a 24-year employee of, of UPS uh, working in Queens in New York. He was fired in February because the company accused him of clocking in earlier, uh, early rather. On February 26, 250 of his fellow employees staged a 90-minute walkout, walkout in order to show solidarity with him. Then they went back to work. Um, union officials say the re way Reeves was fired without a hearing was violation of the collective bargaining agreement, which in fact it was. No matter, UPS doesn't care. UPS has responded to this by announcing its intention to fire all 250 workers. Uh, it argued that the, uh, that the delay that they caused, quote, jeopardized our ability to reliably serve our customers without offering any explanations to how. As of April 8, 36 had been fired. The company says the rest will be fired as replacement drivers are, tra are, 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 are trained. So what this means, apparently, the company is apparently not concerned about jeopardizing its ability to reliably serve its customers through the use of an entire fleet of rookie drivers. No. Not when the company uh, is presented with the opportunity to dump 250 people who actually remember that union means together as one and who are making middle class wages and the opportunity to replace all of them with a whole crew of others working at beginner pay and minimum benefit levels with the possibility of breaking the union right along with it. UPS is not on your side. You should not be on theirs. Those are just two examples. I'm sure that there will be more, but for the moment, we are simply out of time. I will see you next week. Peace.